So my topic is uh, oh, papers entitled uh, uh, Thomistic Resources for Contemporary Ethics of War. Now, <clears throat> just war is one of the areas in which St. Thomas's thought gets the most play within the public, within the public sphere. Uh, whenever armed conflicts arise, his three criteria of a just war are inevitably trotted out. Thomas Aquinas, is, these criteria have been cited by the UK's parliament, well, parliament, parliamentary committee. You know, ideas are discussed by contemporary well, analytic philosophers. So it's actually one of the ways in which he has penetrated into uh, contemporary thought wider than the circle of Thomas. The, nonetheless, there has been an eclipse of just war in the teaching of the Catholic magisterium. Uh, St. Thomas's teaching on just war has gone unmentioned at least since Pope Pius XII, and perhaps even before. Pope Francis is an exception, but negatively. Uh, he, there's a footnote in Fratelli Tutti. Uh, Pope Francis has just spoken uh, about, uh, cited a passage by St. Augustine, where Augustine encourages a Roman consul to be a peacemaker. And then Pope Francis adds that, um, in the footnote, we don't hold to this doctrine of just war anymore. Uh, and it's a little bit unclear who the we is in this passage, uh, but it, it, it's there nonetheless. Uh, yeah, the, the, the actual line is, uh, uh, Francis writes that Augustine, Augustine forged a concept of just war that we no longer uphold in our own day. And the term just war is in scare quotes. Just war is cited in the Catechism of the Catholic Church again in a footnote, where the term similarly, similarly appears in quote marks, but somewhat more approvingly. Uh, I believe the reason for this disuse can be traced back to Luigi Sturzo. Sturzo had a conception in which there was sort of historical phases, and just war pertained to an earlier stage before states had organized themselves into some kind of community in other words, before the League of Nations. Um, and so for Sturzo, just war was equivalent to uh, self-help, state self-help. Uh, and he thinks you know, once you have organized community, you can no longer allow for that kind of self-help, you know, seeking one's own remedy. Uh, there's a lot that could be said about this, but I just want to point out that when statements such as Pope Francis's or those that you can find in Sturzo, when when can't always assume when they refer to just war that the cons the, the, the two the two terms, both just and war, correspond to what Thomas might place under those two terms. And I emphasize both words, just and war, because a lot goes on what you think war is. Uh, so beware of these equivocations on the term just war, but there have also been in the course of history abusive appeals to just war. Uh, appeals that, that I, I wouldn't, I'm not comfortable with, and I don't think Thomas would be comfortable with either. Anyhow, if we turn now to St. Thomas, he offers four sorts of resources for thinking about war and ethics today. Think of St. Thomas as offering us a toolkit. And the tools are the various texts in which he takes up the question of war. And I've grouped these texts into four categories. All right, first there are texts where war and military affairs are expressly discussed by Thomas. You know, so ex professo treatments of war and ethics. Then there are another group of texts where Thomas enunciates principles that can be applied to the assessment of war. You know, principles like double effect mentioned earlier, and, and there are quite a few others. 
uh, where war might not be mentioned, but where these principles can have great utility for us. Third, there's the way Thomas frames the question of war in the Summa. It's, it's how St. Thomas places war in the sequence of questions. That is very revelatory of the, how he, the optic under which he, he approaches the very question of war, how he frames it. Uh, this is sort of his formal perspective on war. Finally, I think we need, we need to acknowledge that not all of the ideas that St. Thomas proposes on war would be constructively put to use today. Right? So there, there, there are some elements that, that maybe we don't want to follow. St. Thomas was also a man of his own time. And it's important not, not to forget that. All right, and then beyond the text of Aquinas, we need to remember that he didn't view himself as an innovator, right? He, he viewed himself as a part of an ongoing tradition. Uh, he certainly didn't think he'd invented this idea of just war. Um, so by the, same to by the same token, after Thomas, his thoughts remained present and alive. And there's a school that emerged from his thinking. And this school has brought important contributions to moral thinking about war. Now I'm thinking, you know, authors like Francesco de Victoria, but also thinkers closer to our own time, like Jacques Maritain, who I think had really first-rate contributions. Those are just two. There are others that could be named. Um, OK, now just want to review. I'll see how far I get in the, you know, working through these categories. There's actually a lot that can be said. I've had a hard time preparing this paper because my thoughts kept moving out in different directions. And, and you know, I tried starting in one, you know, one angle and say, no, no, no. Then I moved to another. So let's, we'll see how far we get. Okay, text expressively, expressly on just war. Okay, the first occurrence of the term bellum justum in Thomas's writing. It's right after lunch, so I'll ask a quiz question. Anyone know? <laughs> no, I'm kidding you. No, the, the, first, the, the first place in Thomas's corpus of writings where he uses the term bellum used. Yes, you're right. So, and it, yeah, it, the, um, it appears in a discussion of milit what you can, we, I call militant martyrdom. Uh, whether there's an, and it appears in an objection. The objector asks, or raised, I, I don't recall whether it was pro or con this, the, this, this the thesis, but the thesis is soldiers, um, uh, soldiers fighting in a just war can be considered martyrs and receive the title martyr. Uh, so Thomas goes back and forth in this. And the, the objector says, well, fighting in a just war is not, um, it, it does not involve directly the pursuit of a divine good. Because just war is about preservation of the temporal polity. And as, as good as that may be, it's not a divine good. So only those individuals who die um, for the sake of the divine good merit the title martyr. St. Thomas goes back and forth on this. And he pretty much acknowledges, yes, if, if it's a matter of fighting for the temporal polity, even though that may be good, that the individual who, who so dies uh, does not merit the title martyr. But then he adds, that should one die fighting for a divine good, that person who falls in battle might be considered a martyr. Then, next, uh, I'm working kind of moving forward chronologically, as it were. The next mention of just war occurs in the prima secundae pars of the Summa. And it's a discussion of the old law. Uh, so the, uh, the issue is raised, 
about whether the ancient Israelites could have relations with foreigners and what what sort of law could govern those relations with foreigners. And it's in the course of this that Thomas refers to a line in, I forget where exactly right now, but it, the, the line in, in the Old Testament is something like this, when you besiege a city, make it an offer of peace. And this opens up a very brief discussion of what has come to be called last resort. Now, Thomas's commentator, Cajetan, has a, a discussion of this passage. And Cajetan moves it in a way that I don't think is constructive. Because Cajetan says, let's say a state, uh, a state that has been wronged, uh, that state seeks redress from the, 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 the other state that has is, that is caused this wrong. Uh, and Kanjian says, and let's say that, that that state that has been wrong uh, makes an offer of, uh, of uh, an offer of peace, meaning proposes to the other side that it make amends, and the other side fails to. So the state in question goes to war. But let's say after the war has progressed for a bit, and the, the state, the unjust party, now says, I'd like to make amends. I'm, re I'm ready, I'm ready to, to give back what was wrongly taken, and I'll even cover the cost that you've, you've incurred in you know, prosecuting your good, trying to get your good back. Kajitan says, should the, the, the just belligerent, the one who, who had been wrong, must it accept that offer? and cease the war effort. Uh, and Kajutan says, no, it's under no obligation. Why? Because war is, war is a form of retribution. It's a way of reestablishing an order that has been disrupted. So war has the character of a punishment. So, and this is a view of war that I don't think fits in well with Thomas's conception of just cause. Okay, but now moving on, third passage, Book of Job. This is very brief. Interesting here is that Thomas speaks of, uses a different term for war. Not bellum, but gera. What's significant here is that gera was the way popular people spoke about war in popular setting. Okay, and it's sort of um, whereas the term bellum, and especially just war, bellum justum, was the technical term of art. It was the term that was used by lawyers. Um, and I mention this here because th there was Pope Francis gave an interview to a French uh, French uh, sociologist, uh, Dominique Wotton, and, and in the course of that interview, Pope Francis says, "I don't like this term, just war." And so, and Francis elaborates on why he doesn't like the expression. Uh, so here, I think it's worth noting that when Thomas uses this, when he, the expression just war, he utilizes as a term of art that was already widely, well, well was in use by the lawyers of his day. Uh, so he didn't, this was not a, the word he would have chosen necessarily had he uh, developed the theory of just war on his own. He probably would have spoken in other terms because there is something that, there's something about the, the conjunction of those term, two terms that does not, they, they, they do not sit well together. Especially if you recognize that for Sir Thomas, the term war is first and foremost the name of a sin. So, okay, moving on, uh, we come to the uh, question 40 on war, but the, the term war is used before question 40 in the initial discussion of peace. Uh, and 
when Thomas begins the treatment of peace, he announces what he'll do afterward. And, and he notes that uh, whenever one, one treats of a virtue, one must also consider the opposing sin. And he starts listing the opposing sins. And he does it on a couple of occasions. There's, there's one list, and there's another as he progresses. The interesting thing is war does not appear in the first list of sins opposed to peace. It only starts to come up later, which shows that discussing just war was not part of his original plan. It sort of came up as he progressed. Uh, all right. Well, of course, there's the, the famous question 40 on war. Uh, this is what's usually uh, cited and discussed. But in, in most of these treatments, it's just Article 1 that's discussed. And Article 1 treats of the question whether it can ever be permissible to wage war. And then there are several other uh, articles which deal with issues such as, as it can never be right to wage war on holy days, you know, uh, whether clerics can participate in war, and whether ruses, subterfuge, can be rightly employed in war. Trickery, which is very relevant to intelligence work, spying, and so forth today. Okay. There's a, obviously a tremendous amount I can say about question 40, particularly Article 1. That's where Thomas lays out the three criteria of a, of a, the three criteria that must be met if a war is to be considered just, namely legitimate authority, just cause, and right intention. Uh, after question 40, war makes its, it, it's, not the term itself, but reference to soldiers, uh, comes up in question 64, Article 7, on lethal self-defense. What's significant here is that Thomas is very careful to say that he's talking about private self-defense. Uh, and he he makes reference to soldiers acting in self-defense simply as a point of contrast to the main topic of this article. This is significant in the contemporary setting uh, because there's a line of thinkers who go, they go by under the name revisionist just war theorists, uh, people like David Rode and Jeff McMahon, who try to build up a theory of just war on the basis of what they call reductive individuism, right? And reductive individuism is the idea that uh, use of force by states is must follow the very same criteria of re a use of force by individuals in self-defense. There's no essential difference between the two. But Thomas very carefully distinguishes the treatment of self-defense from the treatment of war. And in so doing, he follows Roman law. Because in Rome, under Roman law, self-defense was treated under um, civil law, and war was treated under public law. And I think there are very good reasons to keep these two apart. And part of the problem with this reductive individualism is that it, 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 it views the state as just the sum of its parts. There's nothing special about a state. The state doesn't represent a special kind of, a special kind of moral good, actually. Only individuals are good. And, and you know, if you keep pushing this line, international public law will be subsumed under human rights law. So there are a set of problems that emerge. All right. Time is passing very quickly. The next place where Thomas talks about war is in his treatment of prudence. He earmarks a special form of prudence for military affairs. He calls it prudencia militaris, 
And this was, this was an, uh, an innovation. I know of no other author who spoke of prudence as uh, spoke of military affairs as 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 requiring uh, spoke of military affairs as uh, meriting a distinct form of prudence. The the authors before Saint Thomas, and he even cites military manuals, always spoke of generalship as a as an art. And when you speak of something as an art, it's not, it's not in, inherently within the moral order. Okay? Because an art, an art is always directed to, its, to the, the artwork, to the thing made. The, per, the person, the artist, has to follow, you know, be directed to the ends of human life. But that's a different matter. But Thomas thinks that there's something that there's something about military affairs that calls for a special form of prudence, and he calls it this is complete prudence. So really, what I find Thomas doing here is reacting against what you would call an a, 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 an artistic vision of politics of the sort that you find in Machiavelli. Whatever gets the job done is good, all right. And if you're a general who can secure victory in the most effective way possible, you're a good general. You're, but Thomas disagrees with that because being a, being a good general means using military force for the, for the common good. And he's really clear that the common good is not restricted to the good of the single polity. It's, you know, it, it's under this wider horizon. Uh, and, and recall that for Aquinas, Prudence in the complete sense of the term requires right inclination. So that too is something that's called for by people who, who assume military function. All right, then there's this treatment of battlefield courage. The, the, um, and here he has quite interesting things to say about the importance of uh, rectified um, the importance of managing one's emotion, particularly under situations of great stress. And that's what a situation of war is. Uh, the, the German, the, the word war, the English word comes from the German root weir, which means thrown into confusion. Uh, hence you get like a worst, which is everything mixed up. But in in, in war, people's emotions are thrown up into terrible confusion. And it's very, it, it's extremely important that the people who participate in war at all these, at, at the different levels, uh, and, and of course the, the, the emotion that first and foremost arises is fear. But on the heels of fear comes the other emotions. There's anger, there's there can be revenge, there can be hatred at the very worst. Uh, so these emotions have to be managed. And, he's, he, and he, he tries to explain you know, the, the key elements in, in this process of managing the emotions. Uh, and and I've, I've, I've really been struck by how this, this importance of managing emotions in relation to war, it, it, it cuts through all levels. It's not just people in the military. It's in the, the, the public also. I, the think about the reactions in both Israel and Gaza among the populace. It, it, it's very hard for people to see clear on what an appropriate response would be. There's such anger and even rage. Uh, and you can get into these terrible, vicious cycles where the leaders think that they're satisfying the public's urge for, well, yeah, for revenge even. And um, and then the the leaders, on the other hand, will will seem to encourage that. So then the, the citizenry thinks that's okay. You get into this very bad dynamic. Uh, the yeah. all right. There's one last passage in the summa where Thomas refers to military affairs. And I'll give you a hint, it's in the Tercia Pars. 
Do I have any takers for the quiz question? It's the sacrament of confirmation. Uh, I discovered this uh, preparing a speech for my son's confirmation. And, um, and I have to admit, I wrote a whole book on Aquinas on you know, war and peace, and I never came across this passage, so I didn't read far enough into the summer. Uh, Thomas likens bishops to generals. And the confirmants are likened to, in, in, in Thomas's day, um, soldiers would receive a, an insignia on their forehead. So he works up this whole idea of uh, that being a Christian involves resisting evil. And it's sort of the idea of the church militant comes up here. Uh, all right. I think I'll conclude uh, by just noting how uh, I think many people have read Aquinas, question 40, in the wrong way because they've taken this question 40 and made it into a detached piece. And there's something that's been constructed called the just war theory. And the just war, whenever, and you just trot out this just war theory when certain kind of conditions come up. Uh, and it, and what I don't like about this detached just war theory is it's no longer part of a wider vision. It's really not even no longer part of, of political theory. It, um, Thomas doesn't approach it that way, and that's why I said that his way of framing the issue of, of war in the Summa, question of war, it's set within the context of peace. The, the reason for even coming into the issue of just war is, is that there, there are people who disrupt the peace. And when the peace is seriously disrupt, disrupted, that's a sin. We need to think about the reestablishment of peace. And just war has a role to play in that. But he's very clear that uh, at the very best, at the most, use of force will remove maybe some obstacles to peace. But peace can never emerge from, from force itself. Uh, so the, uh, and Jacques Maritain wrote the fantastic essay in 1933 entitled The Hierarchy of Means where he tries to say that, yes, there is a place for the use of force, but we have to understand that this, this means is, should be always kept subordinate to a whole set of other means. And he lists them. First, there are, there are means like prayer. Secondly, there are positive contributions to the good, building sound institutions, and so forth. And he said, finally, there's use of armed force, which has its place. But he said, whenever we use armed force, we have to coordinate it with these other means, set it in connection with them. They have to interact. You can't think about just where it's just some isolated, isolated out on its own. Uh, and I think that this, this Martin's way of presenting this is really brings out the, the optic that the perspective that that St. Thomas brings to war when he sets it in this con wider context of peace. So, thanks very much. <laughs>